The Game Boy dropped in 1989 and became a huge success, but as the years ran by, its sales naturally began to decline. In 1996, it launches the first Pokemon games, and it's a colossal success, revitalizing interest in the dying Game Boy. Meanwhile, other Nintendo properties have made their jump to 3D on the Nintendo 64, with notable titles including Super Mario 64 and The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. With demand for Pokemon to make the jump to 3D being high, HAL Laboratory, with the help of Creatures Inc., made Pokemon Stadium which came bundled with the N64 Transfer Pack, a device that allowed players to use their black and white sprite-based creatures to battle it out on the big screen with colorful 3D models, as well as play minigames and even play the Pokemon Game Boy games on the TV. While this satisfied the curiosity of what battles looked like with 3D technology and dynamic animations, fans wanted the next natural step of what a Pokemon game could be. While the next core games would stay locked to handhelds, Pokemon wasn't going to miss out on the blossoming 3D market. It's 2002 and the Pokemon company creates Genius Sonority to develop the next 3D Pokemon game, something they have no experience with and they only have a year to do it. Wanting to shake up the series, Genius Sonority gets to work. 2003 arrives fast and Pokemon Coliseum releases on the GameCube with some mixed reception. The negativity mostly stems from some saying the game was packed with battles, too difficult and being visually underwhelming. Not all of this can be deemed negative, given closer inspection. Pokemon games typically open with a child leaving their home on their 10th birthday to receive their first Pokemon to set off on a journey, in lush environments to catch and befriend Pokemon as they make friends along the way. This was the case for the first three generations of main series Pokemon games. Genius Sonority wished to flip the Pokemon formula that fans had come to know and wanted to make a statement with it. Pokemon Coliseum sets its tone in its first minute as West, the main character, uses an explosive to break into the base owned by a criminal organization he used to be a member of, Team Snag, to steal a device, the Snag Machine. Created to steal other trainers' Pokemon while he escapes on his futuristic motorcycle with his fully evolved Pokemon through the desert. First impressions are vital for an unknown developer given the keys to develop a game in one of the most popular video game series and they made a strong impression with the opening. It's this juxtaposition of scenarios that catches fans' interest and sets the tone for the entire game. Instead of leisurely walking through a grassy field, the trainer speeds off to an open desert with a building exploding behind them. Trainers are given one Pokemon to start their adventure with, starting at level 5, but Coliseum shows two Pokemon already owned by the trainer, both sitting at about level 25, a sizable level jump from the main series. Further differentiate this game from the main series, Every battle in the game is a double battle, where two pairs of Pokemon face off against each other. The main Pokemon games are generally simple enough to where the player only really needs to use the most powerful moves to progress to the next battle. However, double battles are an entirely different mindset. Here, trainers will prioritize using stat boosting moves, abuse dangerous AoE attacks, and even have both Pokemon attack a single target to take out a potential threat quicker. This completely changes how the game is played and now the player needs to keep track of taking out the pair of Pokemon while also keeping their guard up to not lose their own, as this can snowball where the player is battling two against one, something very difficult to recover from, likely ending in a loss. And being a home console game, Coliseum doesn't necessitate the need to be saved at a moment's notice, so it uses manual save stations, which 
intentionally or not, increases the difficulty of the game by not allowing the player to save after long stretches of gameplay, making a loss sting that much more. The game is set in the Ori region after Wes steals the snag machine. He makes his way to Fennec City where he intercepts a girl being kidnapped. This is Rui, and her kidnapping was due to the ability to see Shadow Pokemon, another twist added to the game. Shadow Pokemon are experimented on to be emotionless fighting machines and are the main way to obtain Pokemon in the game. They are distributed to trainers throughout the Ore region by an evil organization called Cypher. Shadow Pokemon are obtained by stealing them from trainers using the Sag Machine, which is what Wes stole in the opening cutscene. In a Pokemon game that lets you steal other trainers' Pokemon, it offers some of the worst in the series. Pokemon originating in Generation 2 from the Johto region. Most of the Johto Pokemon here are underwhelming. This boosts the difficulty of the game, an unintended consequence, for better or worse. The reason for this set of creatures is because Colosseum's sole reason for existing is to provide the Johto Pokemon that were not included in the main series Generation 3 games, being Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald, which focused on the Hoenn Pokemon, as well as Fire Red and Leaf Green revolving around Kanto Pokemon. The snag mechanic helps lend to the darker nature of Colosseum's lawless setting, having the ability to steal others' Pokemon, made all the more off-putting when realizing that some trainers don't realize that the Pokemon are evil, since only Rui can detect that they are. This mechanic was likely inspired by the fourth Pokemon movie, Celebi Voice of the Forest, where Pokemon were captured using Dark Balls and turned evil, where in Colosseum, the snag machine exists to capture others' Pokemon to purify them from evil. And coincidentally, Celebi appears in the game by granting the power to purify Shadow Pokemon. The main focus of the game is to purify all of the Pokemon corrupted by Cypher and stop them from taking over Ore. Purification is a lengthy process, as a gauge must be emptied before the Pokemon can be pure again. This can be done by walking, being sent out to battle, calling out to them during hyper mode, and using special scent items. Shadow gauges can be reduced immediately with the use of time flutes, but these items are very rare. Using shadow Pokemon can be tedious as they cannot level up, learn new moves, or evolve, and can only learn one self-damaging move, Shadow Rush, so there isn't much usefulness in keeping them in this state. Only once they are purified can they progress as normal. This could be seen as an incentive to purify them as soon as possible to further push the narrative that these Pokemon must be purified, as they would become stronger to aid Wes in capturing, purifying, and strengthening more Pokemon to take down Cypher. Normally, Pokemon games have the player journey off to defeat eight bosses known as Gym Leaders and take on a gauntlet of bosses during the final hours of the game known as the Elite Four, but none of that is found here. Instead of Gym Leaders who focus on single-type teams, Wes will need to defeat the four Cypher admins, Mirror B, Dakim, Venus, and Ein. Despite the game being all double battles, which are generally more difficult than single battles, these bosses can be very unassuming for those unprepared, especially to catch all of their Pokemon. With a majority of battles in the game, there really is no rhyme or reason for the Pokemon and the moves being used, that is, until the bosses, where the challenge lies. This is especially true because despite using the same team every time, their starting pair of Pokemon sent out are randomized, so there isn't much way to truly counter their opening selection. The first admin is Mirror B, who resides in and rules over Pirate Town. This is a decaying town crawling with thugs, and it runs with one of the best themes in the game. The Dancing Man's role is to distribute Shadow Pokemon to Pyrite's citizens. He specializes in a Rain Dance team with his four Ludicolo, all of which have abilities to activate in the rain, whether it's Rain Dance to heal themselves or Swift Swim to double their speed. And to add to this, the rain boosts the power of water-type moves. The two Ludicolo with Rain Dish are of note as they also have moves that can heal themselves. The stalling nature of these Ludicolo combined with the sweeping potential of his other two can prove devastating left undealt. And Mirror B's Shadow Pokemon is a Sudowoodo that knows Rock Slide which can deal with flying types who are super effective against Ludicolo. Next is the bodybuilder Takim who is met at Mount Battle, a battle facility with 100 levels where he tries to steal a Time Flute for Ein, a rare item used to instantly purify a Pokemon. He uses a straightforward Earthquake and Protection combination. One Pokemon uses Protect to prevent damage while the other teammate unleashes an unrestrained Earthquake to hit both opponents. He also has a Marsh Stomp which can deal with fire types to cover his Matang's weakness. His Shadow Pokemon is Entei, one of the legendary beasts, but it doesn't have synergy with his team. What it does have is a weakness to ground type attacks and coincidentally doesn't have Protect, only adding more challenge to catching it. 
Following is the TV star Venus, who resides in The Under, an underground city which she runs with an iron fist full of even sketchier people than Pyrite Town, which is directly above this city. Her position at Cypher is to transport Shadow Pokemon from the Shadow Pokemon Lab using the subway system to distribute them in The Under and gives the rest to Mirror B. Her Pokemon focus on using Attract, which makes opponents have a harder time connecting their attacks. Half of her team is male, the other half is female, which will guarantee her inflicting this status on her opponents. This battle can be frustrating, and to add to the frustration, some of her Pokemon's moves have secondary effects like flinching, paralysis, and confusion, to name a few. Her shadow Pokemon is the legendary Suicune, arguably the best of the legendary beasts. It will tank attacks that aren't super effective, and potentially finish off the remaining player's Pokemon that are either unable to attack due to attract, or inflicted with one of the numerous status conditions. The final Cypher admin is the scientist Ein, who is discovered in the Shadow Pokemon Lab. He is the mastermind behind the creation of Shadow Pokemon and is the most difficult admin. Like Mirror B, he also uses a Rain Dance team, but utilizes the move Thunder to his advantage. Thunder is a powerful move, though only has a 70% hit rate, but under Rain Dance boosts its accuracy to 100%. That combined with Surf and Hydro Pump, boosted by the rain, can spell trouble for the player. His legendary is a Shadow Raikou, and it will be one of the Pokemon abusing perfect accuracy Thunder, and given Raikou's high special stat and speed, can end the battle quickly. Once all admins are defeated, Wes and Ruby head to the final area of the game, Real Gam Tower, a building that has been under construction throughout the course of the game. Here, more Cypher battles will take place, which includes admin rematches, but their teams are even tougher. Mirror B sticks with his Rain Dance team, but makes some alterations. His Rain Dish Ludicolo upgrades its Mega Drain for Giga Drain, and his Swift Swim Ludicolo learns Ice Beam to cover its Flying Weakness and upgrades Absorb for Giga Drain, and its Water Gun for Waterfall. To double down on protecting his Ludicolo, he replaces two of them for a Golduck and Armaldo to counter Flying and Bug types with Ice Beam and Rock Slide respectively, and includes a Loudred with Earthquake to counter Poison types. Dakim continues his Earthquake Protect combo, but is much improved as his new Claydol and Flygon have Levitate, making them immune to ground-type attacks, allowing for both of his Pokémon to attack on the same turn, even if Earthquake is used. He adds a twist with Sunny Day, a move that buffs his Fire-type attacks, allows for Solar Beam to fire instantly instead of needing to wait a turn, and cuts the power of Water-type moves in half. His fire attacks counter ice types, which devastate his new levitating Pokemon, and Sunny Day protects those that are weak to water. Venus isn't really much to note, as she still runs her attract gimmick with moves that can deal secondary effects, but adds more status moves to the list, making the battle more frustrating. Ein still uses his Rain Dance team to abuse Thunder, but has Pokemon with Lightning Rod, an ability which will draw electric type attacks to them, preventing damage to those weak to those attacks, being his flying and water types. It's worth noting he also has a fixation with Toxic on almost his entire team which will cause more damage to opponents the longer the battle goes on. The decision to have Toxic is odd as he doesn't really have bulky Pokemon or stall moves to abuse its effects, but it is still worth watching out for. With the admins defeated again, Wes and Rui make their way up to the top of the tower. Winning multiple battles, they face the main villain, Nascor. He focuses on using stat-boosting items to power up his Pokémon, which is in conjunction with his good mix of offensive and defensive Pokémon. His hard hitters consist of Gardevoir and Blaziken, and his bulky Pokémon are Dustclops and Waldering. His shadow Pokémon is Metagross, which is both a hard hitter and a bulky Pokémon. Letting Pokémon like Gardevoir and Blaziken get set up with special attack boosts can easily end the battle. He also has Pokémon that use moves that inflict confusion. The final boss is Ebis. He is the hardest boss in the game and one of the most difficult in the series. He is the leader of Team Cypher and his Pokemon are a noticeable level jump compared to the players, and will be a big uphill battle due to his team. They consist of Slowking, Scizor, Machamp, Salamence, Slacking, and his shadow Pokemon Tyranitar. Excluding legendary Pokemon, Slacking has the highest attack stat in the series up until this point, but is put in check with its ability Truant, which forces it to attack every other turn. 
When given the chance, he will use his Slow King's Skill Swap in combination with his Slacking to remove Truin. Removing this ability will almost guarantee it to one-shot Pokemon every turn with its massive power. Backing up its incredible power is its defensive bulk which is quite high and is difficult to take down without fighting types. Even then, it can counter with Aerial Ace, a flying move. Slacking can even boost its attack and defense stats with bulk up, making it near impossible to defeat with physical attacks unless getting lucky with critical hits. To add insult to injury, his Slowking can pass Truin off to an opposing Pokemon. His Machamp also has bulk up and can result in a similar situation to Slacking if not dealt with. Salamence can buff itself up with its Dragon Dance move, boosting its already high attack and speed, not to mention having Intimidate to reduce both opponent's attack stats. Scizor is an interesting case because not only can it double its attack with Swords Dance, it can also use Baton Pass to give that doubled attack buff to any Pokemon on the team, making for a scary result. Shadow Tyranitar is the most straightforward Pokemon of his team, with 4 damage dealing moves, but is a powerful threat nonetheless, especially being a pseudo legendary. Safe to say, Evis is worthy of being a final boss and earned his position at Cypher. Defeating Evis will conclude the game and Ore saved. The player can go back to catch Miss Shadow Pokemon and purify it if so desired. There is even a battle against Wes's evil alter ego who possesses the last obtainable Shadow Pokemon, and his team almost hits level 70. Some would say Genius Sonority made an objectively flawed game, that the increased difficulty and focus on battles was a detriment to its true potential. While maybe not reaching the highest peaks it could have with its limited creature count and underwhelming visuals, it definitely made its mark on the series and held its own as a solid Pokemon RPG. With its grittier tone, increased difficulty, focus on story, limited creature pool, and distinct shadow mechanic, it still stands as one of the most unique, challenging Pokemon experiences ever made, and Genius Sonority should be proud of what they accomplished. The Ori region is inspired by Arizona, making Coliseum the first Pokemon game to be based on a non-Japanese location and first to be in America. Sorry, Unova. Fenix City itself is directly inspired by Phoenix, its capital city. Genius Sonority wanted to age up the characters and bring out a darker, bleaker world for the aging audience at the time, so they settled on the desert and shadier locales like Pirate Town, The Under, and Shadow Pokemon Lab. I have to talk about the music. It's excellent. Composed by Tsukasa Tawada, he injects a desert feel to his pieces, especially with three pieces in particular. First, with Outskirt Stand. It sounds dry and desolate, especially with the wind added in, but it has a bit of a positive spin to it, giving it a light, airy tone. The second with Pyrite Town. Gives off that rough and ready to tumble vibe with the snapping, and of course that saxophone just hits. I don't even know how to describe it, it just is really catchy. Absolute banger. And third being Agate Village.
It's a nice relaxing song appropriate for this peaceful grassy area with mostly elderly people, just hanging out, living life. But it's that harmonica that cements itself as the instrument that screams Wild West setting. My other favorites? The normal battle theme. Tawana brings tension at the beginning as if a high stakes encounter, then what would be heard as a more traditional Pokemon battle theme plays throughout the middle, followed by a slight sinister set of notes that circles back to being tense. I love this theme, and Pyrites, and listen to them on loop, they're so catchy. I also very much enjoy the underappreciated title theme. The menu theme. The first battle. This one is just fun and a little whimsical. No stakes, just let's see how tough you are. A good, catchy time. There's also the under. Another one of my favorite pieces. It just gives off this grimy, dirty feel to it, very appropriate for the location, and it's one of my favorite locations in the game, an underground city with neon lights. What's not to love? I mean, besides all the shady people. The Fennec City theme is so nice.
brings a calm serenity to Fenex City with the water flowing throughout it. It's a nice contrast both in music and appearance to the rest of the game. Almost as if Fenex City is not a completely different game with how different it is. And I cannot talk about this game's music without bringing up the main man himself, Mirror B. His music complements the Dance Master and his motif so well. It's so off-base for Pokemon, but since everything else about the game is so off compared to the rest of the series, it just fits so well. I would regret going through making this without mentioning the animations and size scaling. Genius Sonority and Creatures Inc. made the Pokemon in Colosseum so dynamic. Some models look iffy because they're ripped from Stadium and Stadium 2 on the N64, but the animations still hold up. Every time the Pokemon attack, they give it their all with how fierce they strike or how graceful they move. Every time they are attacked, you feel the impact and feel their pain. And every time they faint, it feels like a punch to the gut. Their reaction from fainting makes you want to try harder to prevent any more of your Pokemon from meeting the same fate. You do really feel more connected to your Pokemon when they have this much expressiveness to their bottles. It really does blur the line, helping them feel like they could be real creatures. A special shout out to the animators who worked on Zigzagoon. Its recovery after being attacked is running between Willy's legs. Like that's just, just so cute. I love it. And as for the scaling, all the Pokemon feel appropriately sized. Zigzagoon is tiny. Plusel is tiny, Furret is tiny, and Wailord is huge! Look at this big boy! I remember replaying Colosseum, being in a battle with the trainer in the under, and they send out their magic and Phoebus, which is pretty funny, you gotta chuckle out of me. But then he sends out Wailord, and its size was crazy! Had my Entei out, which is a sizable Pokemon, but Wailord just dwarfed it in comparison. I love the GBA games, but those sprites can only do so much. On GBA, Wailord's cry with its sprite animation helped convey its size, being big and sounding slow. But through Colosseum, blown up to scale on a TV really shows how massive the Pokemon really is. It made me smile. I mentioned Mount Battle before, it's a facility that has a hunter battle, gone like to the top of a mountain where the player can receive points to spend on rare items and TMs, and can receive a time flute upon reaching zone 100. This facility is accessible throughout the game, but once all shadow Pokemon are purified, you can take them out battle challenge for a special reward. This can only be completed with Pokemon originating from Pokemon Coliseum, as Pokemon are able to be traded to and from the Game Boy Advance games once the game is beaten, and if you beat all 100 trainers, you will receive a Ho-Oh. This Ho-Oh will have Mattel as its trainer ID, and what made this Pokemon special is that this was the only way to obtain Ho-Oh at the time of this game's release, with the exception of very limited in-person events, which distributed access to an in-game event where players can go to Naval Rock in Fire Red, Leaf Green, and Emerald to catch it. These were the only ways to legally obtain Ho-Oh, as Heart Gold and Soul Silver wouldn't release for another six years. Now for glitches, one of my favorite parts about this game. There are three glitches I want to talk about. First is the X item glitch. X items are one-time use items that boost the stat of a Pokemon it is used on depending on the item used. If using an X attack, it will boost the attack stat of a Pokemon by one stage. In Colosseum, when selecting an X item to use, it is automatically used on the Pokemon whose turn it is to fight. 
so you cannot choose which Pokemon to use it on. However, targeting the Pokemon you'd want to use the X item on with an item that would have no effect, like trying to use a revive on a non-fainted Pokemon or a full heal on a healthy Pokemon, it would say it's meaningless to use that item. At this point, it would kick you to the previous screen where you can then select the X item and the buff is applied. This would allow for a single Pokemon to be buffed and then attack on the same turn. The second glitch is the walking glitch. This glitch can be achieved by abusing clipping done in Agate Village. Have Wes walk up to a ledge at the entrance and unplug the controller from the system. Tilt the analog stick forward, plug in the controller, and let go of the stick. If this is done correctly, Wes will walk in place. It is best to have 6 shadow Pokemon in the party and 1 in the nearby daycare center to lower the gauge of 7 shadow Pokemon at once. Do this 7 times and all shadow Pokemon will be ready for purification. The final glitch, and my favorite, is the Pokeball glitch. Money isn't as plentiful as it is in most Pokemon games, could say it's another layer of difficulty added to the game by limiting resources purchased, but to help ease the penny pinching, you can have infinite Pokeballs. You need to have at least one of two different types of Pokeballs, i.e. one Pokeball and one Great Ball. While in battle, on your first Pokemon's turn, select item and choose the desired Pokeball, in this case, the Great Ball. Choose the Pokemon you want to catch. Now on your second Pokemon's turn, select item again and under the Pokeball section, press X or Y and swap the position of the Pokeball and Great Ball. Return back to the battle menu and continue from there. The Great Ball will then be thrown, but it will not actually be counted as used up so you will still have the same amount of Great Balls as when you started with as many times as you abuse the glitch. This works with Master Balls too, so use it to your heart's content. There's a really neat mod available for Colosseum called Grand Colosseum, which adds the physical special split, fairy typing, updates the stats, moves and abilities made in later generations, infinite TM usage, new shadow Pokemon, gym themed Colosseums, and even a couple regional forms from other Pokemon games. And you can save anywhere by pressing the R button, which brings up the PC. You get a portable PC. That is incredible and such a great feature, and I want it in every single Pokemon game. Ever. I don't care how broken that would be. And the mod can be patched to the game and run on official hardware, which I just find so cool. Yes, plenty of other games can do that, but still, it's really nice that it's possible. I'm someone who personally prefers to play games on original hardware. Pokemon Coliseum has a sequel called Pokemon XD Gale of Darkness, which was released in 2005 and continues the story five years later, though Wes, Rui, and many other characters are absent from the game. It almost feels like a soft reboot, with new locations, characters, and even all new shadow moves added in. There's at least one reference to Wes and Rui in the game, which I appreciate, though wish there was more. The game even had two Generation 4 Pokemon before the generation actually started, that being Munchlax and Bonsly. And Bonsly was even playable, despite a minor role. As a sequel, it improves on various mechanics established by Coliseum and improves overall gameplay and visuals. Looking at you, Jump Pluff. Unfortunately, Pokemon Coliseum doesn't get recognized by the Pokemon Company aside from having Shadow Pokemon and Pokemon Go. Even then, when Pokemon Day comes and goes, it never really gets mentioned. But Tsukasa Tawada, bless this man, still uploads renditions of his Coliseum music because he knows the fans would appreciate it. He recognizes our love for this game and his music and shows even in a small way that we are acknowledged and that there is someone from the original team at Genius Sonority who understands and cares. So despite everything, overall I say thank you Genius Sonority. Thank you for Pokemon Coliseum. Happy 20th anniversary.